A new report by the United Nations Environment Programme says Nigeria needs an additional $83.6 billion in order to meet the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. The report is the result of a survey conducted by the UNEP inquiry, working with over 40 financial market experts, including the FMDQ and other public and private financial sector stakeholders. The report is launched at the Exchange Place here in Lagos. The Sustainable Development Goals came into force in 2015 after the Millennium Development Goals were phased out. The year 2030 was also set as deadline for the fulfillment of these goals, covering eradication of poverty, achieving quality health care, education, peace, infrastructure and industrialization, amongst others. The biggest challenge to achieving these goals has been funding. The annual budget and releases cannot fund maximally what we are expecting, we are expecting from and what we should do for our people. At this time, we'll... This gathering is at the welcome. instance of the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, to launch a report about avenues of sustainable funding after a survey undertaken by over 40 financial market experts. We urge participants to commit to supporting the implementation of the action plans contained in the report so that millions of Nigerians can be lifted out of the thresholds of poverty in line with the tenets of the Sustainable Development Goals. It was your environment minister at the time, Amina Mohammed, who invited us in and asked us whether we might uh, assist. And the first thing that we did was to work on a sovereign green bond. So a bond issue uh, from the government, the federal government of Nigeria, whose purpose was to fund activities compatible with the Sustainable Development Goals. A UNEP inquiry was carried out in 2014, and that inquiry is closing this year. The UNEP inquiry report says Nigeria needs about $91.9 billion annually, but only gets about $10 billion, which is not even sustainable. This means an increase of about $83.6 billion is required. So the challenge here is that currently we would need to increase current levels by several orders of magnitude is about 10 times less at the moment. So where does that gap come from? If we have about roughly 10 billion flows now towards infrastructure development and we need 90 billion, where does that gap come from? And I feel that generations cutting across the board are all part of the solution and it will require a real change of trajectory that will involve many stakeholders. Many of the stakeholders are represented here. Many of them are involved in this project. The deadline, the 2030, is only 12 years away. The private and public sectors of Nigeria will have to up the ante using equity and debt documents, including green bonds and grants, through risk mitigation, vast sustainable guarantees, sustainable insurance and sustainable credit enhancement, amongst others. It's been two weeks of intense negotiations in Poland on the rule books that guide the operations of the Paris Agreement, which countries approved in 2015 in the French capital. It's the final hours of negotiations and parties are yet to agree on a text. At this time, scientists and civil society are asking governments to do what's right for the people and the planet. And this COP actually has to embrace, accept these findings of the IPCC report and identify a way forward. It's not just to put it front and center, which is obviously key, but what are they going to do from here? Are they going to go and increase their ambition, which would be the smartest thing to do if you understand what is in the science right now? So they have to translate this science into climate action. We already knew in Paris that uh, there was a gap between the NDCs and the long-term goals of the Paris Agreement. Parties here in the next hours need to lay the groundwork to actually get countries to increase their ambition uh, in their NDCs and set a domestic, except that they're going to have a domestic process to get that those higher NDCs in place by 2020. So at the moment, finance rules are not sufficiently uh, addressed and they are not sufficiently robust and transparent to uh, spur more climate ambition and action in the coming years and also to 
build trust between developing and developed parties. What's really interesting to see is that next, last week, actually, we saw uh, a lot of countries such as Germany, Sweden, New Zealand, France, the EU, Belgium, and Italy make new pledges to the Adaptation Fund, and the overall amount reached $128 million. And we also saw, like, Germany and, and uh, Norway uh, announcing a, a doubling of their contribution to the GCF. And obviously, those uh, contributions are really welcome, but they are not sufficient, as we also need to have finance reflected in the rule book. So uh, in these final hours of, of negotiations, we actually need those countries who stepped forward last week uh, to acknowledge that there is a need to have finance reflected in the rule book and that this, this will be a key element to respond to the needs of developing countries for adaptation, for mitigation, and also for loss and damage. From climate change, let's switch gears and take a look at some business news. And here's Emana Amawe. Thank you, Joma. Welcome to Business News. The 36 state governments and the federal capital territory will soon have access to the World Bank's $750 million loan and grant facility. This was made known by the Minister of Finance, Zainab Ahmed, while addressing the seventh community of practice made up of state commissioners of planning and budget in Abuja. The minister explains that part of the conditions given for the bailouts include a fiscal responsibility plan which needs to be implemented for the states to remain qualified to access the funds from the federal government. The National Automotive Design and Development Council is planning a pilot phase of electronic vehicles operation next year. The Director General, Mr. Jelani Aliyu, explains to automotive sector players at a session that the Council is already in talks with manufacturers as well as battery charging companies. Well, you know, the role of government is we are catalysts and we support the private sector. So, like you mentioned, I talked about the uh, uh, pilot program we're looking at doing. Uh, so, we've already started discussing with a number of uh, electric vehicle manufacturers and electric charging station manufacturers to, you know, strategize a pilot program where we will have a number of these vehicles in Nigeria, on Nigerian roads, both on public roads and in uh, controlled environments to understand the viability, applicability, and obviously some of the challenges that we would face, and then work together with the stakeholders on seeing how best to adopt this technology. Um, as we're all aware, some countries have even, you know, set mandates and dates on phasing out uh, electric vehicles. So when we do these pilot programs, we will, in a, we will be in a good position to formulate policy to support that new technology. Nigeria's headline inflation rate was up for the third time this year in November, in line with analyst forecasts driven by increases in the prices of essential food items. According to the latest data released by the National Bureau of Statistics, the country's headline inflation rose slightly by 0.02% to 11.28%, up from 11.26% recorded earlier in October. The composite food index rose by 13.3% in November against 13.28% within the comparative period. At the same time, the urban inflation rate increased to 11.61%, up from 11.64%, while the rural inflation rate increased to 10.99%, up from 10.93%. On the other hand, the core inflation rate dropped slightly by 0.1% to 9.8%, as against the 9.9% recorded in October. Bargain hunting by short-term investors saw the equities markets regain marginal ground, with the all-share index closing the last trading day of the week up 37 basis points. Tosin Additional has a summary of the day's transactions. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. Nigeria's stock market ends Friday's trading session with a moderate 0.37% rebound in the All Share Index and 41 billion Naira added to the total value of listed equities. This comes on the back of fresh bargain hunting by short term investors after three days of profit taking this week. The market's performance was mostly driven by positive performance by mostly mid cap stocks across all major sectors of the NSE except the industrial goods, which fell due to load shed from Dangote Cement.
The top three best price performers are the shares of Berger, First Aluminium and United Capital, while the shares of PZ Cussings, Sterling Bank and Fidson are the top worst performers. The shares of FCMB and UVA are the major contributors to nearly 340 million shares traded in over 2,200 transactions for the day. That's the Stock Market Report. I'm Tosin Additional. Thank you, Tosin. Meanwhile, stocks on Wall Street are down as investors turn their attention to weaker than expected China industrial production and retail sales data. Markets in Europe and Asia also took a major shaving today. For more on markets in Africa and the rest of the world, let's see the closing numbers. And that's business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Emana Amawe. Thanks a lot, Emana. Amnesty International has reacted to the Army's suspension of the United Nations Children's Fund's operations in northeast Nigeria over allegations of spying and collaborating with Boko Haram. In a statement, the director of Amnesty in Nigeria, Osai Ojigo, says, quote, Amnesty International strongly condemns attempts by the Nigerian army to demonize UNICEF's life-saving work in the northeast of the country, where the Boko Haram conflict has created one of the deadliest humanitarian disasters in the world, end of quote. The organization describes UNICEF's suspension as part of a wider drive to intimidate international humanitarian and human rights organizations who are working to save lives in the devastating conflict. Ms. Ojigo says the suspension of UNICEF will deprive those whose lives have been devastated by Boko Haram of the much-needed humanitarian assistance. And in Somalia, at least 11 people have been killed in the southern city of Bayoda after clashes between the police and supporters of a former al-Shabaab leader seeking election as a regional president. The central government's internal security ministry in Mogadishu says its forces had arrested Mukhtar on the suspicion that he had brought militants and weapons back to Bayoda, the capital of the southwest region where he is running for president. Mukhtar is one of the leading candidates seeking the presidency in the next week vote. And he has been a major threat to the influence of Somalia's federal government in the southwest. British Prime Minister Theresa May says it's still possible to get the assurances MPs need to back her Brexit deal, despite the EU leaders ruling out any negotiation. At a summit in Brussels, she admitted she had a robust discussion with European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker after he complained about a nebulous and imprecise debate. However, Labour insists the withdrawal deal is now, quote, dead in the water. There is work still to do, and we will be holding talks in coming days about how to obtain the further assurances that the UK Parliament needs in order to be able to approve the deal. All negotiations like this are always tough, there are always difficult times, and as you get close to the, you know, the very end, then that can get uh, even more difficult because you're absolutely sorting out the last, uh, the last details of something. Uh, but this is what, what drives me to con carry on doing this and making sure we deliver is that this is what's right for the British people. A fourth victim has died following the gun attack on a Christmas market in the French city of Strasbourg. The suspect in Tuesday's attack, Sharif Shakat, was shot dead by the police patrol after he opened fire from a doorway on Thursday evening. The French media say a fifth victim is brain dead following the attack and 11 others remain wounded. Four of them are in hospital. The attack had locked down the city with more than 700 police and soldiers hunting for the gunman. The 29-year-old had a string of criminal convictions in France and Germany and had become a radical Islamist in jail. We have an update in the last couple of seconds and let's just give it to you now as we're hearing that the army's suspension of the United Nations Children's Fund's operation in northeast Nigeria over allegations of spying and collaborating with Boko Haram has been lifted. 
And earlier in a statement, the director of Amnesty in Nigeria had said Amnesty International strongly condemned the attempts by the Nigerian army to demonize UNICEF's life-saving work in the northeast of the country, where the Boko Haram conflict has created one of the deadliest humanitarian disasters in the world. And as we're hearing and reporting to you now, that suspension has been lifted.